computer. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Make and HR Wellbeing, a priority to prevent a burnout crisis. My name is Emily Pearson, and I'm the founder and managing director um, of Our Minds Work. And with me today is my colleague, Emma Carhart, and she is our workplace mental health educator. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Our Minds Work. For those of you who don't know who we are, I have recognised quite a few uh, faces and names already who we know. Uh, Our Minds Work, are we've been around coming up to five years now. Um, we've been working in the workplace mental health field for eight years in total um, and Our Minds work was set up after I left working with MIND. One of the things that we really exist to do is to create mentally healthy workplaces that thrive and we do that by providing a framework for strategy building and delivery and we also provide a range of services, training, workshops, webinars and ongoing support for HR teams, well-being leads, um, and anyone else who's responsible for, you know, mental health and well-being in the workplace. So we're very excited to have you all here today with such a really important topic that we definitely need to have a conversation about. And I think this is something that we talked about in the early days when workplace mental health became a thing. Um, that HR were often given the responsibility to develop and deliver mental health and well-being strategies, initiatives, improve mental health and well-being, um, without any kind of knowledge, training, expertise, or background to know how to do that. And my concern was always, well, who looks after those people as well? And this, for me, was probably one of my fears has now been realised that we're experiencing an HR burnout crisis. We're gonna start off with a little poll to get you going. Um, pretty simple, it should just launch on the screen. There are three questions for you to answer. Um, who are you? So we'd like to better understand who you are. So I am responsible for wellbeing and mental health in my HR role. Is that yes, and I'm HRD manager, yes, uh, I'm an advisor, no, or I'm not in HR, but responsible for well-being and mental health. So it'd be good to know who's in the room today and what your responsibilities are. Number two, which answers can you relate to? I feel burnt out and I'm, in, I'm an HRD. I feel burnt out and I'm a manager. I feel burnt out and I'm an advisor. Um, I'm concerned that my team is burnt out. So this one is multiple choice. Oh, I'm not feeling burnt out at all. And question number three, are you planning on leaving the HR profession because of how you feel? Yes, no, I'm not sure. Um, these are some of the questions that have already been asked uh, on a wider research level, but it's always good to get a good idea of what's going on more locally for the HR and wellbeing professionals that we come into contact with. So 71% participated. I'll just give people a few more moments to complete their answers. Be good to get um, a bit more participation on there to move those statistics up a little bit. So feel free to complete those three questions and they are absolutely anonymous. Nobody can see your answers. Even we can't see who's answering what either. Sorry that the poll isn't working, Amelia, not too sure what's going on there. Feel free to pop your answers in the chat box though, if you would still like to answer those questions. Tell us what level manager you are or not. You know, you know, are you struggling at the moment with, with burnout? Um, are you planning on leaving the profession because of what you're experiencing? Okay. I'm just gonna end the poll and get some feedback on these results. So what you should be able to see now are the results. So we have 38% in the room today um, who was responsible for wellbeing and mental health and an HRD manager level. We have 38% um, who are in the advisor level with responsibilities for mental health and wellbeing. Um, 
we do have 13% who's not in HR, but responsible for well-being and mental health as well, which is great to see. Which answers do you relate to? The top answer, 56%, I'm concerned that my team is burnt out. I'm wondering why, you know, what are you seeing in your team that's making you feel a bit concerned about them? You know, pop your answers in the chat box. We'll definitely have time to have a look at some of these. 25% experience and burnout as an HR advisor, 6% as a manager, 0% as an HRD. But we do have 38% in the room that are not currently feeling burnt out as well. Question number three. 75% said, no, I'm not planning on leaving my role because of how I feel. 6% saying yes, but 19% still quite not quite sure. I wonder what would potentially tip you over the edge into a yes or a no. Hopefully we can prevent that from happening today with some of the topics that we're going to be covering. Thanks for just engaging with that to get us going. We're just going to make a start on having a better understanding of why we're here. Why did we actually design this webinar in the first place? At Our Minds Work, we're constantly keeping up to date with what's going on in the well-being and HR space, um, especially since HR tend to have the biggest responsibility for health and well-being. Um, the latest reports from CIPD and SAGE were really concerning. What they were telling us was that 44% of HR professionals said that they had experienced work-related mental ill health. 81% reported being burnt out. HR professionals have reported having less empathy for their CEO, organization and employees. And you will find out what empathy has got to do with um, burnout a little bit later. The HR profession had the highest turnover between June 22 and 2023. That was a huge concern, with 62% of HR professionals considering leaving the profession. As a workplace mental health professional over the past eight years, this, unfortunately, for me, is no surprise, and it was a fear that I had you know, many moons ago. I have also worked in health and social care for decades as a practitioner, frontline practitioner and a health and social care trainer. And Emma has also worked in the health and social care field for, I think, over a decade now as well. Um, this is something that we know a lot about. And this is also something that we know about from the health and social care professional world, that if it's not tackled, then we see huge problems, problems within organisations, the reputations of organisations, obviously people's mental health and well-being is um, impacted, people's professional lives are impacted, their families are impacted, um, and ultimately it impacts the people who we were initially there to care for in the first place. So it's something that we feel we've got to try and look at and do something about. I'm going to now hand you over to Emma, she'll do a little introduction to herself. And she's going to start us off with having a better understanding about what is this burnout that we're experiencing. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. As Emily said, I work within Our Minds Work as a workplace mental health educator. So my role is to work with people on the front line, people in the HR departments, um, senior managers, management and so on, all, all the way through an organisation to help them to understand how they can create that mentally healthy culture. And as Emily said, burnout particularly, we want to get ahead of the curve on this. We're heading potentially for that burnout crisis, particularly within HR professionals and and this is this webinar is just an attempt to really get underneath that so we've used that term an awful lot so far so i think we probably better flesh out and define exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about burnout so let's have a look at this so the actual term burnout uh, was first kind of put out there in the 70s by a psychologist herbert freundenberger excuse my german um, and he talked about burnout being the consequence of severe stress and high ideals experienced by people working in helping professions. So I'm just going to pull that apart a little bit. It's particularly related to those who work in the helping supportive professions, healthcare, social care, education, and it's brought about because of severe stress. So all of that stress being work related and high ideals by the person who's in that position. 
So thinking about whatever the job role is, caring an awful lot about it, giving themselves, giving more than themselves as part of that job. This whole phenomena of, of burnout was actually put out there. And today in 2023, it's recognized as all occupations, so not just the caring, helping professions, all occupations can actually experience this. Burnout is a term that's only related to work, um, and it's it's caused by work-related issues, stress, and so on. And it's recognised at a level that the ICD-10, which is used to diagnose conditions, would actually recognise it as burnout. So this little part that I'm going to talk you through is just to help you to really to understand and maybe even recognise within yourself or even colleagues that that might be happening. Because what we want to also do as part of this, this webinar is not only educate people on what burnout is, but help them to kind of get ahead of the curve, recognise signs, and, and do something about that before it gets to the crisis situation. Situation. So let's have a look at, at some information around what causes burnout. So thinking again about your role in the HR profession, um, we know that experiencing workplace stress, and that's chronic workplace stress, that's not been successfully managed in an organisation over a long period of time. So have a think about yourself, have a think about your colleagues, have a think about the employees within the organisation. So that's workplace stress that's not been successfully managed over a long period. High ideals of what you're expected to achieve. So just sit with that a second. Whatever your job role is, you have very high expectations of yourself and what you should do, what you should deliver versus the reality of you being able to deliver that because that might be an issue with resources, time, um, expectations and so on. But it's that conflict between the two. So this can cause burnout. Lack of recognition or rewards for the level of the input you've made. You know, I could really, you know, give a really simple example of what we mean by this, but it's just literally giving 150% of yourself and not feeling that it's either recognized, appreciated, or rewarded. And that might be monetary, it might be just somebody saying thank you, but it's it's kind of causing it, it's causing this kind of disruption in how you're feeling. Um, a lack of a work community. A lack of a work community. So that's about the people that are around you and your teams and that sense of actually it's just one one for yourself. It's not necessarily people looking after each other. It's feeling that work is just literally I'm working on my own here. I'm not part of a team that looks out for each other. And it's, I'm really struggling with that. Um, and a values mismatch. Now, again, those that work in the care and professions, um, we often do that. We often do that and put ourselves out there because we care so much, because we align ourselves with the values of an organisation. We want to kind of achieve the whole mission uh, that the organisation has. We want to carry that forward. What can happen is because of the pressures of money, for example, or resources and so on, those things get squeezed from the organization so an individual might feel actually my values are starting to mismatch with what my organization is actually expecting me to deliver cutting corners for example shorter time scales not allowed to spend time with an individual and um, all these things can kind of culminate in ex us experiencing burnout so the last slide that I wanted to talk us through was literally the, the, the stages of experiencing burnout and what that might feel like for an individual. So there's 12 of them that's been put forward by Herbert Freudenberger. And I just want to tell you a little bit about each of them. And then Elmi's going to talk, talk a little bit more about how that can, if you experience this, can also be a risk of experiencing compassion fatigue, actually how you care for the individual who you're working with. So the first stage is a person might be feeling, I need to prove myself in my work I feel I need to strive to prove myself to prove my validity but to prove my worth within an organization so that can go on but because of that you work harder and harder and harder and we know what comes with that all the other things can potentially go by the side so you end up potentially neglecting your own needs and that might be needs for self-care that might be the needs to engage with family friends that might be looking after your physical self but this this is a third stage neglecting your own needs basic needs so that can kind of progress and you might think actually I'm a, I'm a bit conflicted here because you might start getting sort of fallout from people around you it might be in the workplace that might be at home but the sense is that it's not my fault and, and you know I need to carry on this is what I need to do to kind of deliver um, but you feel a bit conflicted because these people that are around you that are objecting might necessarily be people you really care about or value their opinion however 
we continue on and you focus on work more. So kind of throwing yourself into it, maybe working longer hours, making more effort, caring more about it and feeling more emotionally tied to that. So because of that, you might start experiencing problems in your work life. So maybe conflicts with colleagues. It might be, you know, quality of work that's on there as well, but also experiencing this within the home. So that might be, again, friends, family that start to, to, to experience the impact of mood changes, for example, things that you might be experiencing. But you're denying all this because you're denying it's caused by work. This is just what I need to do. I need to deliver. Because of that, because of the need to kind of deliver and work at 100% all the time, you might be withdrawing from your social life and your family. So not only do they, they're kind of concerned about how you're changing, but, but to, to deal with that, what you might do is withdraw from them. So you give less of them to the, to, to the, to the ones who love you uh, and so on. Because of that, those behaviour changes, that upsets people around us. So you might start noticing a bit of conflict, a bit of concern by those loved ones. So it's this kind of two-way two, two -way battle between yourself and your loved ones. They probably notice it, but you don't notice it yourself or you're actually denying that's actually happening. Generally, you just don't feel like yourself. This is not your normal self. And that's where the concern from the others around us probably comes from. Because way back at kind of stage five, stage four, people are noticing that's not yourself and that you notice a gradual change. And even you start to notice, I don't feel like my normal self, either at work or at home. And because of that, you start to feel empty, numb. And as we know, in terms of our mental health, we all look for ways to make ourselves feel better in those situations. So whatever is your go-to, you might start you know, using food, you might start using smoking, for example, or even substance use to help you to feel better, to help you to cope, to help you to manage. So that might be creeping in too. And gently, you're just feeling low, just feeling really low, low mood, lost. So I don't have a focus. I don't know why I should be focusing on this. Why is my family so upset and exhausted? I think that's something to really emphasize absolute exhaustion mentally and physically as well. And as you can see, the last, last stage on here is just burnout, mentally and physically collapse, full burnout experience, very dangerous as well in terms of your physical health, in terms of your mental health, because you've got nothing left. So as Emily is saying, what we want to do is encourage people to think about, get ahead of that curve, think about where, where if anywhere, do I identify as being on here in those 12 stages of burnout? And how might that be a risk to me and my role in the HR? Okay, thank you, Emily. Thanks, Emma. It's um, a little bit humble in reading, reading through those and going through those stages. Um, I've experienced burnout myself probably numerous times. Um, I, I remember experiencing it when I first started working in health and social care after about three years of working in my early 20s. Um, within the criminal justice system for young people, which was basically a prison for um, under under 18 year olds. Very, very stressful environment, restraining, a lot of restraining, a lot of abuse. And because of that, I got to the point where I was in the definitely the red mental and physical collapse and actually had to leave that job. Um, so the, the work that we get in to do that we love, where we need to prove ourselves, you know, and show that we're really great at this and we love doing this, unfortunately can lead to you leaving that career or that job. And unfortunately, the people who you were there to help. And part of that and part of what we experience in the health and social care profession is compassion fatigue. And I do truly, and I know Emma feels the same, feel as if HR, are uh, experiencing this too because of this big responsibility now for employees mental health and well-being we've reduced stigma around having conversations about mental health so much that people are more open to having them they're asking for help at work hr um hr professionals having to deal more often with people who are in distress who are um you know even potentially at risk of suicide or significant harm to themselves or others um, when we experience this helping part of this profession which I think HR has just kind of signif signified that's not even a word um, 
<laughs> amplified with the mental health and well-being taken on board, but then also the impact of the pandemic over the past three years as well, um, the constant levels of stress and pressure from that on top of having to think about how are you supporting everybody's mental health and well-being um, as we went through that pandemic that was impacting everybody. And you know, you've probably all heard it. Are you putting on your oxygen mask before you're helping anyone else? Um, and, and it's something that even health and social care professionals uh, struggle to do. We are much better at looking after other people than we are ourselves. And unfortunately, it can be a hard, hard lesson to learn. So compassion fatigue, we've got to start off with what is compassion? Compassion is actually quite complex. Compassion isn't just one thing on its own. Compassion is about recognizing that somebody is suffering and be motivated to take action to alleviate that suffering. So there are six essential qualities and attributes that make up compassion. And without them all working together, then unfortunately we may find that we're unable to be compassionate. So if you think about, you know, your work in HR as a profession, especially over the past three, three years, four, five, six years since workplace mental health became a thing and then we hit the pandemic, you know, how often in your daily work have you had to um, have sympathy for somebody, be non-judgmental around the things that they're telling you, be sensitive towards other people's needs, have distress tolerance. And what that means is that if somebody's upset and distressed in front of you, you tolerate that level of distress without becoming just as distressed as that other person. So this can take a lot to do, um, being able to tolerate somebody else's distress. Showing empathy, feeling empathy. So this isn't this isn't just about you know something that we can can just understand. This is about being able to feel what it must be like to be in that position that that person's in, but then being motivated by that, and that motivation is really important because without that motivation, compassion doesn't happen. You have to be motivated to take action to alleviate somebody else's suffering. Yeah, and in HR. Health and well-being, health and social care. This is exactly what we do every day. We listen to people. We have empathy. We're sensitive towards their needs. We tolerate their levels of distress so that we can be motivated to help them. This takes a lot out of people. Um, compassion is one of the NHS's big C's, the six big C's that they have, um, compassion and care. But what we know through the you know, health and social care and the NHS you know, experience this as a lot is that compassion fatigue happens when you are having to engage in this level of emotional intensity every single day. So I wanna break this down a little bit so we can really understand um, a little bit more about compassion. Um, and I want you to look at this image. I'll tell you a little bit of a story. Let's just imagine that you're on holiday. Um, you are obviously feeling great, feeling good about your holiday. And you're walking down the street, you're on your phone, you're taking selfies. Um, what has to happen first for you to show compassion towards this child? Pop it in the chat box, take yourself off mute. What has to happen first while you're taking your selfies? Um, your holiday pictures while you're looking all glamorous with your tan. What has to happen first for you to show compassion towards someone? Well done, Jen. You actually have to see them. You've got to be able to notice that little girl sat there who is suffering. Yeah. So first, first one on there is what do you notice? So you notice she's there, but then what are you noticing about her? chat box feel free to take yourselves off mute what are you actually noticing about her is it like her physical you know what she actually looks like instead of maybe how she's feeling it's more the actual physical look of the individual yeah so 
you, you, you're you probably making an assessment, aren't you? Mm. So she's a child. She looks like she's on her own. She looks dirty. Um, she's got scrapes on her knees. She, she's in this really vulnerable state. Um, so you're going to start to notice her suffering. Yeah. So you notice it. Then how do you feel? How does that make you feel noticing her suffering? Again, pop something in the chat box. I'll have a little look in there. Yeah, she's alone. She needs a hug. Oh, it breaks my heart to see her. Absolutely, Jen. And this is this is just an image that we're feeling that empathy. We're feeling that emotion just by looking at a picture and looking at a picture that somebody is suffering. You know, how are you feeling? Heartbroken. So then what's the next one? What actions will you take? Do you just walk on by? what happens next so you've noticed her you've got empathy you're starting to understand her suffering I don't know what's going on there. what actions are you going to take yeah you're going to get down beside her ask her does she need any help start talking to her and that is the compassion bit to try and alleviate that person's suffering yeah it's a really, really powerful thing to do. Now, imagine doing that every single day. Yeah. Numerous times a day working in these helping professions, which HR, I do feel is that the changing role of HR is leaning now more into a heavily compassionate role where people are suffering and they're coming to you and asking for help and support on a regular basis. So what's compassion fatigue? It was first identified in the 90s. Um, Carla Johnson, who characterized it as a unique form of burnout. And the way that she described it as being unique was because it tends to happen much quickly and seems to be unexpected. Where burnout, come, which comes from back in those days in the 90s, was classed as a, a workplace phenomenon, it would tend, it could even take up months and months and years and years to start to experience burnout, where compassion fatigue happened to be happening much more quicker and seemed to be unexpected. It was then defined a little bit later by a psychologist as a state of exhaustion and dysfunction biological, physiological, and emotionally as a re result of prolonged exposure to compassion stress. Yeah. Feeling those emotions is stressful. It triggers the stress response inside of us. Um, you know how much we can, you know, get emotional just watching an advert on the telly. We know that actors, we know that they're not real yet. We can start, you know, feeling really emotional and even have a few tears now and again. Um, you know, that is our stress response being triggered by somebody else's suffering. When we're experiencing compassion fatigue, you are going to recognize signs and symptoms regularly. Um, like burnout that we've just looked at, that Emma talked us through as well. But there will be a couple of other determinant factors. Um, obviously, burnout and exhaustion, lack of enjoyment in your work anymore. You'll start to really feel quite cynical about your work. You'll start to lose any empathy or caring for others. One of the things that I always um, think about when I think about compassion fatigue in the NHS is, you know, the old old school matrons that you, the old school matron, she, oh God, I've forgotten that comedy show, but she was always miserable, had no care or compassion for anyone. For me, that was just the, the whole character of somebody who was in a caring profession who was experiencing compassion fatigue. So you may experience emotional intensity, so feeling more emotional than what you usually would, and even a cognitive decline in it being impacted on your work. But what is quite unique to compassion fatigue is you may start to feel anger towards casual events and or people. And this means that our distress tolerance has begun to decrease. We have much lower 
levels of distress tolerance. And if you've ever experienced a mental illness before, like um, depression, if you've ever experienced depression before, your bucket is so full, it is already overflowing. Um, having to deal with somebody else's stress, distress or trauma can be just, you know, really, really too much to, to bear. So we then have a lack of distress tolerance because our levels of stress caused by that compassion fatigue have increased. And also, again, as Emma mentioned, we may see an increase in drug and alcohol use or abuse, but also anything else that we find that we're trying to um, you know, numb our emotions with. This could be food, it could be our phone, you know, it could be um, anything that we are using to, um, to numb those emotions and feelings. Another report that this kind of hit, hit home for me was um, from Business Solver. I will send you all the links to these reports that I've been reading. And the, they measure empathy every year within the HR profession, and they've constantly seen a decline. However, last year was the biggest decline in empathy that they've ever experienced from their research. So what they found was, they asked the question, you know, how empathic do you think each of the following are currently? And we'd seen a huge decline in HR experience and empathy fatigue, not just for others, but feeling that others' empathy had also decreased as well from the CEO, from their organizations and their employees as well. Remember, empathy is just one attribute of compassion. So if we're seeing empathy decline, the less empathy we have, we're not going to have compassion. Yeah, we're not going to be able to take that action and help people. If it's one of the one of the questions that, you know, we, we, we think about, you know, who would you, you know, oh gosh, who would you feel like you would have more empathy for, um, you know, that child that we saw the image of? or an adult homeless man? Who would you look at helping first? Who would you have the biggest levels of empathy for? It's an interesting question because it does really impact, you know, our levels of empathy and compassion and who we do help more. Um, but what this has shown us is that there is a huge deficit and we are seeing empathy fatigue as well. So question to you, do you think HR are burnt out? but also experience and compassion fatigue as a unique addition to the HR burnout situation. Again, feel free to um, jump on uh, the chat box or if you would like to unmute yourself, we like to have a little bit of a chat. Just having a little look. Okay, anyone have any views on this additional compassion fatigue that we've just talked through? Do you think that HR are also experiencing compassion fatigue? Nobody wanna chip in on this one? No? Someone in the chat box. I think it's happening in your team. Yeah. So you feel like you're recognizing this, this going on. Yeah. Hearing more stress and happiness. Yeah. What are you seeing? <laughs> what are you seeing in yourself and your team? What are you hearing? Yeah. Some really, really great uh, ways to recognize what's going on. Um, you know, what are you feeling? What we, we do pick up on other people's emotions and feelings. Um, what are you feeling in your team? Do you think that this is something that's happening now? And if it is, what can we actually do about it? Emma is gonna take us through a little bit of an individual solution in tackling self, um, tackling compassion, fatigue and burnout with self-compassion. I'll leave this Thanks, to you. Emma. Thank you. So yeah, as Emily said, you know, part of this webinar is wanting to be able to create a space for you to take some information away that might be useful. So 
compassion and being able to show compassion to yourself is a good way to kind of build your own ability to be compassionate to others as well but we really want to focus on the need to be able to do this so what i'm going to share with you on the next three slides is based on somebody called dr kristen neff's uh, research around self-compassion and she talks about some elements of self-compassion a little bit like emily talked about in terms of you know empathy being one of those parts of being able to be compassionate but i really want to focus in on yourself and, and share this information with you and get you to think about how compassionate am I to myself? And we'll also be backing this up with a, um, a questionnaire for you to be able to do this yourself in our follow up email. So the first kind of parent we want you to think about is how kind am I to myself, self kindness versus how self judgmental am I? Because the risk here is if you if you fall into the trap of self judgmentalism all the time, then you're going to really struggle to be self compassionate. So what we mean by self kindness here is that being able to look at any mistakes and whatnot that you've actually made for yourself, but being able to give you that comfort the same way. If you think about this, as you would talk to a good friend who maybe be experiencing some difficulties, the same kind that that you're experiencing. So being kind and understanding as you would a good friend, understanding that we are intrinsically deserving of this kindness. So think about applying this to yourself, what your natural reaction would be to a friend, applying that to yourself rather than going down the route. And we've all been guilty of this, of beating yourself up, self-judgment. What did you do that for? That was silly, that was stupid. And deserving the care and concern like everyone else. Thanks, Emily. So the next two I wanna focus on really are, and get you to think about my own levels of, of your sense of common humanity, as in, I'm a human being, I am merely mortal, I am not, I am not a, a superhero, versus isolation. So things actually happen only to me. And it's that expression where, why has this just happened to me? Only me, I only ever experienced this. So let me tell you a little bit more about this, because obviously what we wanna have more of is common humanity. And if, if we just have a look at this, it talks about, understanding that we're, we're not alone in our mistakes if we do make a mistake you know if we if we have a weakness if we have any feelings it's intrinsically human that's where we talk about common humanity and it's a normal part of everyone's lives but i think this is really amplified in the work setting because we feel we have to deliver we've had a few comments um in the chat box already about the you know need the reason i was pressing on when i was feeling stressed is because i didn't want to let people down and so on but if we we kind of develop this understanding of i'm only human i can only do so much with so much that i've got um, rather than seeing ourselves in isolation, having to save the world purely ourselves. And the final one, just to share some information, is mindfulness versus over-identification. So again, we're just asking you to think about, do I fall into the mindfulness area or do I fall into that over-identification? So that's when you get stuck in this thought loop. Oh my goodness, I should have done this, I should have done that, I should have done the other. Rather than accepting it, kind of processing it, doing what you need to do and then moving on from this. So mindfulness is the kind of where we want to head. And it's the ability for us all to be non-judgmental of ourselves, receptive to what's going on and what's popping up in our minds. And we absorb our, sorry, observe our own thoughts and feelings as they appear, as they are, without trying to suppress them. A bit like Emily was talking about before, how can you be compassionate if you don't notice it starts with noticing your own thoughts and feelings around something. So that's where it begins. Um, and, and understanding that we can't ignore it and we can't feel compassion for it at the same time. And, and that's where it all begins, isn't it? So those, those three elements are what the questionnaire will help you to establish. Oh my goodness, do I tend to lean more towards over-identification, isolation and self-judgment? And then what you do about that is the next step. So that's what we'd like to share with you in terms of how you can develop your own self-compassion. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Emma. So the question is brilliant. So we'll send you a link to it. There's loads of resources on Dr. Kristen Neff's um, website as well. And if you would also like to read more about self-compassion and your self-critical voice, you can take a look at Professor Gilbert's work around self-criticism. Um, we do obviously provide uh, workshops around self-compassionate care and looking at uh, self-criticism in a little bit more, more depth too, which 
you know, I can send you some information around if you're interested in it. But do the questionnaire, super interesting. And then it gives you loads of ideas on how you can make improvements on your self-compassionate care. So, what does HR need to prevent burnout? You know, we're going to come up with some, we've come up with some um, some solutions, but we don't know everything and we don't know what you need. So it's really important that we better understand your needs. Um, I'd love you to pop them in the chat box um, and tell us a little bit more about what do you think HR needs to prevent burnout? Could this be stuff that you need personally, your team, or what does your organization need to do and take responsibility of? You know, let us know in the chat box what you think, maybe the same as what we're thinking, or it may be something new. We're going to look at these solutions as organizational solutions, team solutions, and individual solutions. This makes sure that we're looking at it from, um, from, uh, from different systems and levels to make sure that we're starting at the top and working our way down to the individual. Um, you know, if, if we just focused on the individual, um, it's a bit like, you know, just telling everybody, you just need to, to, to deal with your own burnout. Um, yet we know that work-related stress is one of the biggest causes of burnout, um, which is an organizational problem. So organizational solutions from a lot of the research that we've been reading, one of the things that many HR professionals have said that they need is better support from their senior leaders, better rewards and recognition for their role and their change in an extended role that they're experiencing. We see this a lot when we're working with HR professionals around their mental health and well-being strategies. Um, it, you know, it, it, it feels very, very onerous, yet there's a lack of recognition and also a lack of development and support or even budget being handed over to people in these roles who are there to try and make an impact and improve other people's lives. Obviously, work-related stress is a huge issue. Work-related stress continues to be the biggest cause of work-related ill health in the UK. And even though it is a legal requirement to prevent work-related stress, workplaces are not doing it. They're just not doing it. And if they are, this is brilliant because it's not very often we come across organisations that are engaging in effective systems for the prevention and management of work-related stress. Increased wellbeing solutions to prevent burnout as well. So again, this is about your organisational solution, ensuring that burnout and work-related stress is part of your people and culture strategy. It's part of your business strategy. You know, a business cannot be successful if everybody wants to leave, everybody's stressed, people are on the sick, people are unwell, and people are burnt out. So we've got to look at increasing those wellbeing solutions across the whole organisation as well. One of the other solutions that we found through obviously working in workplace mental health for the past eight years is that often HR have all the responsibility for health and well-being. And this is often down to a lack of appropriate manager development so that managers are able to take on more responsibilities for preventing work-related stress and managing employment, health and well-being concerns and giving them the capabilities to foster positive work and cultures. You know, managers should be able to lighten the load and it is usually part of a man people manager's responsibility to do that. So an organisational solution must be based around developing managers to lighten the load for HR around mental health and well-being within their teams. Increased de development to support the future of the change in HR role. This came through in the SAGE report. One of the top, um, top needs from HR said that now they had mental health and well-being and ad and i responsibilities this was stuff that they didn't have any development previous experience or qualifications in and this is what they wanted you know do you agree with that if you do have mental health and well-being and ad and i in your role do you feel like you do need some additional development to help you to be confident and comfortable in developing and leading transformational change really when it comes to strategies within mental health, well-being and ADNI. Emily, 
can I just ask? Yes. Where you are, somebody was just said in the comments there that they think the PowerPoint might be stuck on the compassion fatigue part. Oh. I can see organizational. Yeah. Yeah. See organizational. I just thought I'd double check. Just, just okay. Double no, check. sorry. I'm definitely on organizational solutions there. Um, team solutions. Think about your team. I've already seen quite a few comments in the chat box as well around I think my team's experience in this. Remember, isolation, a lack of team community are two absolute impacting factors which can either negatively impact or positively impact, especially in this world at the moment where we're working a lot on our own from home. Um, we need to try and get that community back. And within that community, be able to foster a culture of care for each other, where open conversations around these personal impacts and the support that we need can happen. Because if we're unable to do that, we're unable to support each other through these challenging times. Again, work-related stress. This is one of the main factors for burnout. We must absolutely must because it is a legal responsibility do stress risk assessments do a preventative stress risk assessment on your team offer your individuals opportunities to engage in stress risk assessments um, you know it's really really important that organizations and teams and hr health and safety and well-being take this as a priority to do because it's actually causing poor mental health for people and if this was you know nobody's doing a risk assessment um, which is leading to all these people in the workplace uh, ha having cancer from something in the air it would be hell on the health and safety executive would be all over this stuff don't wait for health and safety to you know kind of come down and make it um, you know financially detrimental through litigation to do that we should be doing it to protect people's health and well-being in the first place especially for you and your team be more alert to changes in your colleagues you've seen those 12 signs of burnout now you know i did ask you in the chat box where do you think you are where do you think some of your colleagues might be share that slide with them you know i'm more than happy to share the slides in their follow-up email as well have a team meeting about it. Yeah. Where do you think you are? Um, you know, get people to think about this stuff. But ultimately, we've got to lead by example. And I know that that is one of the hardest things to do ever because we are only human beings. But it's really important that we're able to lead by example for our teams, get these conversations going and support each other to help to improve mental health and prevent burnout in the profession. Individual solutions. So this is for you. Obviously, get involved in the self-compassion stuff. It is really life changing. Being able to switch that critical, critical voice off. Mine's my mom. I haven't spoken to her for many, many years now. Left home when I was 16 because of a poor relationship. My self-critical <laughs> voice that I had for a very, very long time was always my mom. She pops up now and again. However, self-compassion and turning that voice around was really, really life-changing for me. Find out more about burnout and compassion fatigue that we've talked about today. Share this information with your teams, with your organisations and look at, right, what do we need to do to prevent it? What do we need to do to help people to recover from it? But for me, how do I make sure that I'm able to prevent it in its tracks from going any further? Or if I'm nearing that step 12, what do I need to do to recover? Reduce your levels of stress at work and home. You know, our worlds have now become entangled. Work is home, home is work. Um, and as we know, our stress bucket doesn't empty when we leave home and go to work. Um, it continues to rise. So the more stress we have in either our work or home lives, the less stress we're going to be able to deal with in the opposite environment. So look at what can I take action on? What is causing me stress? You could do a little bit of a problem solving um, activity around this. What's causing me stress? What am I not happy with? Yeah. What can I control? What do we need to do about it? Is there a professional who can help me solve this problem? Do I need to just make a decision on this and stop procrastinating on it so that I can move on from it? 
ensure your well-being is priority and make time for it. It's that age old, put your oxygen mask on before you help other people. And, you know, for parents, this seems bizarre to think that you would have to put your oxygen mask on before you helped your child sitting next to you. But if you can't keep yourself alive, your family, your friends, your profession, it's all going to take a nosedive. And access help when you need it. You know, you're probably all very good at telling other people, use the EAP, make sure you're getting support from your team, speak to your manager. But are you doing this yourself? Yeah. Are you accessing that support and asking for it when you need it as well? So I'm just going to um, quickly go through a summary. We will have a couple of minutes left for questions if um, Emma wants to go through any in the chat box and then we'll, we'll open the um, floor for you to unmute yourself. What we've really just gone through there is, as we can see, there is an HR burnout crisis on the way and we need to stop it now. Not only are HR professionals an intrinsic supportive role for a successful company, a successful culture, supporting managers, supporting employees. This is about your mental health and well-being as well. Burnout is not a nice place to be. It turns everything that you loved in your in your profession into something that you become very, very cynical about. You've got no energy, no motivation, and can actually cause you know, breakdowns and mental ill health as well. We need to not go down that route. The benefits of having a mentally healthy workforce altogether, we know is a winning business strategy. We need everybody in the organization to be engaged, to be mentally well, um, to feel supported. So it's really important that we look at doing that and achieving that. Um, and HR, we've been blagging on about this, about everybody else all this time. Who's there for you? Um, what we've looked at is what are the impacts of burnout, which is that workplace phenomenon, but how we're also potentially seeing compassion fatigue within the profession as well. We've just given you a little taster about how you can um, counteract compassion fatigue with self-compassion and um, give you some information about the questionnaire that we do recommend you go away and do on the Dr. Kristen Neff's website. And then we just looked at some solutions from an organizational level, what you can do instantly with your team, and also what you may need to be looking at as an individual as well. I do hope that that's been a useful hour. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Emma, are there any questions in the chat box that I might have missed? There aren't any questions, no, just lots of really positive experiences. People reflecting a lot on how it affects their own workplaces. Um, yeah, very, very clear indication that this is a real, you know, real issue for people. But no questions, Emily, no. OK, thank you very much. Anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a question, make a comment? No. Okay. Let me just tell you before you go about how we can help. Um, you know, that's exactly what our minds work and Emma and I and the team are here for is to help you, to help your organization and to support your team. There are a couple of ways that we can do this. Now we'll send you over some information around this as well, so that you do have it at hand. If it's not for now, then you know it could be further down the line. What our minds work do is we become the mental health and well-being extension to your people team so we can help you to lighten this load that you're experiencing, especially where the mental health and well-being strategy and your longer term plans are around improving mental health and well-being and preventing stress. This is what we do for a living. <laughs> so, you know, we would love to be part of an extended team to support you. And we can do that in a number of ways. We do have a membership program. So this would be an annual membership that you um, that you invest in. That means that you have us on call for 12 months 
We have monthly meetings with you and the team to have these conversations, check on on you, discuss any problems that you're experiencing within mental health and well-being in your workplace. And we also provide resources, workshops on various topics um, like compassion fatigue, which we talked about today, self-compassion. And we also provide webinars for employees as well as part of that membership. So we just become an extended part of your team and are there to help as mental health and wellbeing professionals to support you. We also do deliver management development, and this is to help the managers have the confidence, the knowledge, the skills, the tools, the behaviours to lighten the load on HR. Um, we do this through our level three preventing stress and support and mental health for managers training. Um, we do a generic training course. However, we also are just about to launch um, and mental health for managers, specifically for male dominated industries. And this is where we've developed a male friendly version of helping um, conversations between managers and their male workers to have more effective conversations around mental health and get the support that they need. We can also support with your work-related stress. You know, if this is an organizational thing or a team thing, um, we can provide an audit, focus groups, and a report and action plan to help you get the grips with this, implement an effective system that actually links into your manager training as well to ensure that everyone understands work-related stress, how to prevent it and how to manage it, but also monitor and evaluate it as well. If you are sat there thinking mental health and wellbeing is one of my responsibilities, it's just been kind of added to my title. I have very little understanding of what I'm doing. I would love to be a specialist in mental health and wellbeing. It may be even that you're thinking about leaving the HR profession to, um, to you know, go with your passion of supporting mental health and wellbeing at work. We do provide a level five diploma in mental health culture change, which also covers um, ED&I, it covers menopause, it covers men's health and employee benefits as well. So it's, it's more kind of wellbeing um, to help you to develop and deliver a really impactful and effective culture change strategy. Or if you're just not sure and you would just like a little bit of a chat, uh, let's talk. I'm going to send you over a link to a free 30 minute consultation that we provide everybody that we want to build relationships with. If you already know us and you still want a free chat, let's have it. Um, I will send you a link, but I'm not I'm not um, I won't be a, 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 <laughs> I won't be you know disgusted if you try and ring my phone. I quite like having phone calls with people. So feel free to just give us a ring if that would work for you. Final next steps before you all disappear for the rest of the afternoon to be more self-compassionate and less self-critical. Uh, I am gonna follow up with an email. It will have the resources that we've talked about today. I will pop in a PDF of these slides. The recording will be in there as well. And I'll make sure that that little link and my contact details are there for that free consultation. If there is anything else that you think that we can help with, just get in touch, let's have a chat. Thank you so much for attending today. Um, this has been the Making HR Wellbeing a Priority to Prevent a Burnout Crisis webinar by myself, Emily, and Emma Carhart from Our Minds Work. Thanks everybody, have a great afternoon. Thank you for joining, have a good afternoon.